Chapter thirty four of Paul the Dauntless. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Leeson. Paul the Dauntless by Basil Joseph Matthews. Chapter thirty four The Castor and Pollux. Thrown up like driftwood on the gray shore, they saw island natives coming down toward them. Battered with the tempest and feeble from the long fortnight without proper food, not even Julius and his soldiers were fit to fight for their lives if the natives were to attack them. Behind them sounded the boom of the waves and the crashing of the fast-breaking ship. Before them were the approaching natives, beneath them the barren beach. Above them dark clouds mercilessly pelting their tired, shivering bodies with icy rain. The natives scattered and came on again carrying sticks in their hands, not for fighting, however, but for fire. They threw the sticks together in a sheltered place, and then, crouching over to protect the sparks from the drenching rain, lighted a fire. With friendly gestures and with smiles they now welcomed the shipwrecked people to warm and dry themselves. Rejoicing at this kindness, one and another of the party went off, and came back again with more sticks to keep the fire going. Among these was Paul, who was keen now, as he had been throughout, on keeping up the spirits of the soldiers, sailors, and passengers. As he came back with an armful of sticks and placed them on the fire, one of the sticks seemed to come to life. It shone in moving curves, and before Paul could escape, with a quick dart the viper fastened on his hand. Its poisonous fangs shot through his skin, and as he lifted his hand up, the venomous beast hung there. Every eye was on Paul. The natives saw the chain of the prisoner hanging from his wrist and the viper hanging from his hand. "'A murderer!' they whispered. "'He has escaped from the sea, but the vengeance of the gods will not let him live.' Paul shook his hand violently. The viper relaxed his hold and fell back into the blazing fire. The natives watched Paul to see the poison swell his hand and arm and body as they knew a viper's poison would, and to see him fall down dead. They looked and looked again, watching for a long time. But nothing happened. Paul seemed entirely unaffected. They were perplexed. Then, talking to one another, they swiftly changed their minds. This man whom the very serpents could not harm, whom could he be? He must be a god, a murderer one hour, a god the next. So their simple minds worked, leaping from one extreme to the other. The wrecked crew found that they had been shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Some of the sailors had harbored at the island many times before, for it was on their regular sea route. But they had not recognized it earlier, for the bay in which they were shipwrecked was on an entirely unfamiliar side of the island, far from the big harbor. Fortunately, the governor of the whole island, named Publius, had his lands in the very part of Malta on which they had been wrecked. He invited them to his home and took them in, feeding and lodging them, and giving them all the attention that he possibly could. They stayed with him for three days, by which time the kindness and the rest, the good food and the dry shelter, made the awful weeks of the tempest seem like a nightmare from which they had awakened. What return could they make to Publius? He was rich, and they were all stranded without any possessions. Surely they could do nothing except to thank him. Yet there was a great anxiety on the mind of Publius. His old father was very ill, burning with fever and weakened by dysentery. Paul heard of this, and went into the room where the old man lay ill. He kneeled down by the bedside and asked God for that power which again and again had flowed through him. He then laid his hands on the father of Publius. The fever left him, and the wasting disease dried up. Like wildfire, the news was spread through the island of the great wonder worked at the hands of Paul. Publius had received more than he had given. Others came to be healed from different parts of Malta, and when they were healed they paid all honor to Paul and his companions. Again this strange prisoner's greatness had shone out. He drew the reverence of men who forgot his chains and only saw his wonderful character. As the winter drew on toward spring, they would go down to the great harbor of Malta, which was filled with ships that had put in there during the months when the Mediterranean was closed for sailing. 
when the gray of the cloud skies and the drive of the harsher winds melted before the summer days and the warm wind began to come up from egypt with the birds of spring the harbor began to be full of movement the sailors caulked and scrubbed the decks spliced ropes repaired the sails and hoisted them on fresh spars the merchants were opening their warehouses and bringing out the grain and goods from store the porters ran over the gangways and into the holds carrying the great earthenware jars of grain and wine among the ships in the harbor was a great grain ship from the egyptian coast which had put in here for the winter on her way from alexandria to italy on her prow the picture of two men was painted the twins castor and pollux the twins were gods whom the romans thought of as their great protectors and helpers in time of need especially the sailors said that if the dioscuri came aboard the ship though invisibly she would ride through any storm safe to harbor one of the great roman writers epictetus who himself did not put faith in the twins told the people to have the faith in god which the sailors had in castor and pollux he says be mindful of god call him to be thy helper and defender as men call upon the dioscuri in a storm when the master and the captain of the ship and julius with the soldiers and the sailors saw a great roman vessel in harbor with that name upon her they would remember their shipwreck and would wish to sail on a ship with such a name of good fortune as the castor and pollux they took passage on board and once more after these months on malta they found themselves with the swing of the waves under their feet and their faces turned toward rome from malta to sicily where they dropped anchor in the harbor of syracuse was a short sail after three days there probably loading and unloading cargo they sailed out again to find themselves in the teeth of an unfavorable wind after much tacking they ran into regium the city on the other side of the straits of messina on a strip of land under the shadow of the great brown mountain range that runs down to form the toe of italy they had to wait only a single day in Regium Harbor for the breeze that they wanted, for the wind veered round to the south and they were able to hoist sails and run swiftly northward. It was the last stage of the long perilous journey since the day when, in the autumn of the previous year, they had slipped out of the harbor of Caesarea. The very ship seemed to rejoice. She lay herself out to complete the race with a great final sprint the coast of italy slipped past on their right as the castor and pollux ploughed through the waters that leapt from her side and left a shining wake behind her riding the seas like a queen she shook the spray from her prow making the blue hills of the sea divide shearing a glittering scatter in her stride and leaping on a full tilt with all sails drawing proud as a war-horse snuffing battle pawing at last they saw, over the starboard bow, a dark pall of smoke rising from a mountain top. Vesuvius, said the sailors to the travelers. They had already passed Etna and Stromboli, and knew these strange fire mountains which sometimes threw out blazing lava and red-hot stones. As they turned into that loveliest bay in the Roman world, they saw, under the very foot of the smoking mountain, the gleam of white temples in the sun and on the beach the gay life of a brilliant and lovely roman pleasure city yet within thirty years of paul's passing that mountain was to pour down her sides hideous streams of burning lava which would overwhelm this city of pompeii the castor and pollux with pompeii on her starboard sailed northward up the bay till in the northeast corner she rounded the mole of the inner bay of putioli exercising the proud right which she possessed as a member of the great alexandria putioli fleet she sailed right into harbor with her topsails still unfurled with a creaking of cordage and a rush the sailors furled her mainsail her topsail and her foresail the anchor splashed the rudder paddles were raised and strapped paul standing at the bow would see curving up over the ridge of the hills the white busy pavement of the road to rome End of chapter 34